mighty and living God, who the Son of Jesus Christ, will heal the sick and restore them to a land of life. Look with mercy on the pain and suffering of this world, and restore each person and each nation by your healing power. Through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. And once more, ask the peace, waving to someone, waving to everyone, turn around and share.
in a word of prayer. God, may the words of our mouths and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable to you, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Over the course of the last week, we all three have spent a lot of time in conversation with all kinds of folks across with one another and the council and others in the church, following up from the work that's emerged in our AGM last Sunday. And we realized that we are emerging with a sense that our community is stronger here at AIC. The conversations on inclusion were not always easy. And we feared that they might divide us, and yet, even so, they have thickened our relationships with one another, even those who may, in the end, choose to leave this congregation after our decision on marriage. We still feel like we know one another better than we did before. And so that's why it felt right today for us to to talk about that openly and have a bit of a more community representation in our sermon time. That's also why I noticed first off in this scripture about the woman in the story being so very alone. Her health condition, common to many women, women had made her ritually unclean. So she had been cut off from her faith and community She's in this huge crowd, yet completely and totally alone. And I wonder, I wondered in looking at the story if it was more than her ritual impurity that made her alone. I wondered about her own sense of shame or fear. Did she feel guilty about her ailment? Was she embarrassed that she needed help? Is that why she tried to just touch the edge of Jesus' garment without being seen? The story says she had exhausted all of her own resources trying to get well. Did she feel like she failed? Was she afraid of admitting how much help she really needed? All of this reflection set in the context of our community reminded me that our conversations have required us to be vulnerable with one another. Because actually conversations about not just marriage, but money in the church require us to be actually talking about faith, about friendship, about our own shame in our past selves, about our doubts in our beliefs, about stories of ourselves and stories of those that we love the best, about identity, about sharing our true selves, and whether we will be accepted or rejected as a result. And those conversations remind us that we have to reach out for Jesus and admit that God needs to work in our hearts. We had to open up and admit to one another the places where we need help. Like the woman in the story, we had to be a bit vulnerable with one another in order to be healed. We took risks in these conversations with one another and with God. And it has formed us more closely. That's what happened in the story, too. But that's only a small part of it. What happens is that Jesus reaches out after the woman touches him, and he brings her out of the crowd and into the community. So she's not alone anymore. It had to have been difficult for her to reach out to Jesus at all. And not just squeezing through the crowd to get a handful of his garment, but because it's hard for all of us to reach out when we need help. Whether we're reaching out to a friend, reaching out to find a new therapist, or just 
reaching out to Jesus and admitting that we can't do it on our own. When I was in my teens, I moved to a very small town. A very small town. I'm talking 1,500 people. And I was a little bit shocked. I would uh, go to the supermarket, the only one, and I would see people from church in the aisles while I was shopping with messy hair and wearing my pajamas. And then I would get to the till to find one of my football teammates working a summer job. And then I would go out to the parking lot and find one of my coaches shouting a hello across the, the pavement. And so as soon as I got my driver's license, I started driving a town or two over. <laughs> Because it can be comfortable to be lost in an anonymous crowd. And there, there doesn't have to be any shame to it. Sometimes we just need a little bit of our own space, don't we? And maybe I'm uh, preaching to the introverts here because I am one myself, but I love the anonymous crowd. I love it. <laughs> but the truth is that we all at times, don't we? And we do feel shame in admitting when we need help. That we've come to the end of our own resources. Or we may simply prefer the ease of solitude when opening ourselves up to people around us might feel a little bit like labor. But we need more. The truth is, we need each other. We all need people around us, like this woman did, to draw us out of ourselves a little bit. Because loneliness and despair are real threats to life for introverts and extroverts alike. Burnout and detachment leave many people without any resources left to care for themselves or their family or their loved ones at all, much less to reach out for help. <clears throat> Isolation of those with a different skin tone or culture or language is a life-crushing power of sin in our world. But, what if what if our community and our newfound connections with each other brought us close enough to draw us out of ourselves just a little bit, out of the death-dealing loneliness into freedom and peace? I wonder how our lives as individuals would be differently it would be different if we knew each other well enough to come here on a Sunday and say, friend, I'm not actually well at all. I could use your help. What healing could our church embody if reaching out to each other wasn't so much of a stress? And the thing is, I actually think maybe we're seeing a bit of that here already. As Jennifer mentioned, our conversations on inclusion have required us to lean in to conversation with one another, to become less of a crowd just sharing the same views on a Sunday morning, to a community sharing the same worries and hurts and joys <coughs> and aspirations. And because of that, we can say to other people who still feel anonymous in the crowd, you are welcome here. Full stop. No conditions, no presuppositions, that's it. And if you do just need to come here and be anonymous, that's fine too. You are still welcome, period. But as Jared points to, just being in community with one another isn't where it has been. 
So when we were writing our new welcome statement, we realized that we needed to go further too. Because of our mutuality, me reaching out to you, you reaching back in return, we wrote that this is also a place where you can form friendships, serve others, search for truth and meaning, work for justice, cultivate compassion, find forgiveness, share grace, grow in faith, and in all things, discover God's love. All of those things require us being in relationship with one another. This is our way of saying that now that we're together, don't just try to touch the hem of Jesus' cloak. Go and grab the whole thing. Which gets me to my big wonder about the story, about us, and about our world. What if we weren't simply grasping at hands, but actually embracing one another? What would it look like if we didn't just hope to catch a glimpse of the divine while we kept passing by, but actually brought about that work of connection and healing and justice right where we stand or sit? As we move forward together as a community, I'm already thinking about our work with people seeking refuge as an example of that here and now. The government has, I think deliberately, created a program for welcoming refugees that barely even allows those fleeing war, persecution, and destruction to even touch the hem of our Union Jack book. But we, as a community, we're saying no. We want to offer a full embrace to be fully welcoming of all. And so we've reached out, welcoming two sisters from Syria over two years ago to be our neighbors and our friends. And we're reaching out now to help an Afghan couple who have been living in a hotel for seven months move into their own place again. And we will keep reaching out to welcome Ukrainians and whoever else needs sanctuary in the city, offering that full embrace. What an image that is, moving from a simple touch to a full embrace for Jesus and the women in the story, but for us too, for our community. The anonymous crowd is all around us, full of silent shame and unspoken needs. We in these pews are not exempt. We carry our own loneliness and woundedness. But when we come here, we risk reaching out not just to Jesus, but to one another. Acknowledging we cannot do this life alone. We need one another and we need God in order to be whole. And so we remember this day that at every turn, Jesus responds with healing and with grace, and not just a little bit, a full embrace and restoration. And we pray that we offer the same to one another and to all those others in the crowd in need. Welcome, community, belonging, love, and grace, and healing. All of it in Jesus' name. Thanks be to God. Amen. <laughs>
join with this community that cares about you, whether you're here in the room or joining us online, bringing the joys and concerns of your heart to prayer with us. Let us pray. O oh, Holy One, you came close to humanity in Christ Jesus, and you still meet us where we are. On this Sunday, we think of the ways you have loved us through our mothers and through communities who have nurtured us and shaped who we are. We give you thanks. We remember, as we have studied this season of Lent, that you ran to meet the prodigal son on the road. You sat down for a chat with the woman at the well. You looked up in the tree to call Zacchaeus by name. And you still walk through the pressing crowds, drawing near to those who reach for you. Draw close to us once more today, and teach us to become ever more like you, walking beside the weary and hurting, offering support to the hopeless and lonely, listening to the cries of the suffering and abused, and reaching out for help with humility and trust when we need a companion. Let us touch the hem of your cloak today that all our sins may be forgiven, that we may be free from the power of evil and death, and that we may work, learn to walk in new life. And we pray that your healing touch will reach every corner of our world this day. We pray for peace in all the places where there is violence and war, especially in Ukraine. We pray for migrants and refugees and any who are denied entry, denied dignity, and given only abuse. We pray for the lonely and unloved, for the addicted and the tormented. We pray for our friends and families who are worrying over illness and disease and who are grieving because of pain and death. We pray that we may be part of your global church as a beacon of light and of love for all we have lifted up this morning as you bring healing. And we pray with Christians across the globe and throughout centuries as Jesus taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Welcome once again to Worship at the American International Church. It is good to see you. We are glad you're here. If you are visiting with us, it would be lovely to have a record of your visit and to have your contact details so we can let you know about the ministries of the church and how you can be incorporated into this community that we're reflecting on today. On the back of your bulletin, there's a QR code you can scan to give us your information, or there are some slips of paper in the back if you prefer to do so that way, but welcome. Uh, there are some announcements and information in the bulletin that I invite you to read and pay attention to, but I just want to mention one, the insert in your bulletin for the Bach Cantata next Sunday. We have uh, Eclectic Voices, uh, an amateur choir that Scott directs, 
that will be joining us, as well as the City Block Collective joining us again. Uh, and it will be a, a lovely way to uh, move toward the end of the season of Lent with a, a celebration of Passion Sunday through the music of Bach. Please join us next Sunday for that. Uh, as we continue to worship, one of the ways that we join in this community, that we join in the ministry of God, is through uniting together to do things that are bigger than you or I as individuals. And our work together only happens when we give ourselves, when we give our time, our money, our talents. And so we invite you to find ways to be involved and uh, to give financially to the church. There's a plate in the back and there's information, updated information, by the way, about making a bank transfer on the back of the bulletin or in the description of the YouTube video. Let us give back of ourselves to God through music, through offering, and through our lives as we continue to live. Thank you. 